Okay, so good morning, everybody. Sorry for these uh, short waits. Uh, the, today's talk is uh, given by Sami Dib. <laughs> Sami obtained his uh, PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg. And after that, he had a number of uh, postdocs. Uh, I just uh, listed the latest of which of, of them uh, in Saclay, Imperial College, Niels Bohr Institute. Then he moved as an assistant professor to Atacama University in Chile. And finally, he decided to back in Europe, joining the Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Bordeaux. So now he works there. Um, his uh, research interests lie in the field of uh, the stu study of star formation and its stellar medium. So the origin of turbulence, uh, cloud fragmentation, angular momentum. And uh, this study of interstellar medium is uh, carried out with a variety of techniques. Uh, the title of today's talk is uh, the 1001 modes of star formation that will show us how much scatter is in the star formation process. So let's enjoy the Sami's seminar. Okay, thank you, David, very much. First of all, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, of talking to all of you, and thanks for everyone for attending. Uh, so, as David has uh, mentioned, uh, uh, the, the the talk of the of uh, the subject of the talk is about the variations in the star formation process. Uh, I think uh, over the last few years there is a paradigm shift in uh, in trying to understand. Uh, uh, not so much how universal the star formation is, but how much variations. Uh, by variations, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily imply that it's different physics operating from one region to region or from galaxy to galaxy, but depending on the environmental conditions in a given star forming regions, we may get a process that dominates over the others and we can get some uh, scatter and variations. Uh, so I will uh, just for, I, I think I assume everybody in the audience is familiar with the ISM and star formation studies, but just to set the stage, uh, star formation can be coordinated uh, or correlated on uh, galactic scales, maybe scales of a, a KPC size uh, by a, a variety of uh, gas instabilities, uh, maybe spiral density waves, cloud-cloud uh, uh, collisions, uh, clouds impacting big disk and tidal interactions with other galaxies. And all of these instabilities create uh, compressions. Compressions uh, lead to a thermal instability, a cooling of the gas, and then we have molecular clouds. Typical molecular clouds have scales of you know, maybe 10 to, or maybe smaller than 10, 10 to 100 parsec. Uh, this is the Orion molecular cloud. Uh, and then within this cloud, we have fragmentation happening and uh, mediated by a variety of physical processes, you know, turbulence, gravity, uh, radiation, and the chemical uh, or the thermodynamics of the gas. And these uh, uh, multiple physics uh, can uh, generate uh, local compressions. When these compressions uh, get captured by gravity, uh, we have little cores, which sizes are anywhere between you know, a fraction of a parsec. And then this is where typically stars or small star systems form. Uh, so the, the idea is to try to understand how much scatter there is on these small scales or within a cloud and try to relate this to environmental uh, conditions. So I, in this talk, I'll focus on a few quantities. It's impossible to kind of uh, uh, review all the star formation observables. Uh, I'll focus on the... Um, uh, IMF or the stellar initial mass function uh, uh, and so uh, as you know we we would like to understand what is the shape of this IMF it's important for different uh, fields in astrophysics the high mass end is important for feedback processes galaxy evolution chemical enrichment the low mass end is important for you know planet formation and the mass budget of the uh, baryonic mass in galaxies and so we want to understand if this is a power law or there is turnover or and where does the turnover happen and so on uh, i think also uh, another uh, outcome of star formation is not only the mass distribution of course but the spatial distribution of, of dense cores and then later stars uh, and this holds a lot of information also on what is driving what is the physical mechanism that is leading to the formation of the cloud and their subsequent fragmentation um, 
Two other related quantities are uh, the star formation rate. So basically the star formation rate is how much gas is converted into stars per unit time mediated by a certain efficiency. So we want to understand uh, what is this conversion rate. Uh, and then finally, the star formation efficiency, which is basically what is the stellar outcome uh, in a given star forming region, uh, how much stellar mass do we have out of a total gas mass. Assuming we know what is the initial gas mass, because of course the clouds keep growing and accreting, uh, and uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand what are the initial uh, conditions uh, or the initial gas reservoir. So I'll try to say a few words about uh, each of these topics and discuss basically with a certain focus on how much variations uh, there are and try to present to you a few ideas of um, explaining these uh, variations. So I'll start with the, uh, with the IMF and so uh, it's always a, a, a burning question, what is, is, is the IMF universal or whether there is some variations from cluster to cluster and from galaxy to uh, galaxy. So if we look at uh, the galactic field, uh, maybe the latest, some of the, one of the latest pictures is that uh, if you uh, make the stellar census uh, of, uh, of um, uh, stellar masses around us, uh, you, you will get some, some function like the one that is shown here. Uh, there is a, a slope at the high mass and intermediate to high mass end, which is basically has an exponent of 1.35 in the dn d log m uh, notation. Uh, there is a turnover around 0 0.4, 0 0.3 uh, solar masses, and then uh, fewer uh, brown dwarf and low mass stars uh, in that regime. Uh, I'm presenting here, uh, so if you take the observational data and fit it, uh, you can use many functional forms. I present here the uh, a, a functional form, which is the Tappert power law. Uh, so it's characterized by three parameters, the slope at the high mass end, slope at the low mass end, and characteristic mass. So if we fit the observational data with this uh, function, we get this set of parameters, 1.35 for the slope at the high mass end, 0.5 at the low mass end, and 0.4 at the uh, characteristic mass. <laughs> and so basically this is a system IMF you can uh, derive, uh, applying binarity corrections, you can derive also a single star IMF. Now this is the work of Paravano 2011. Uh, there is a, a little bit more recent work, I think very interesting, by Roger Moore from uh, University of Barcelona, where he um, uh, tries to revisit the, uh, this, um, put more constraints on the IMF uh, using uh, the Gaia data for the uh, uh, stellar kinematics and the uh, apogee for chemical enrichment and comparing these, uh, these observation constraints with the Besançon model. And what he gets actually is, a uh, just to summarize in a nutshell, he gets a shallower slope at the high mass end and a shallower slope at the low mass end. And we've presented a, a paper uh, just one year before, which argues for such a scenario basically based on the idea that there is cluster to cluster variations. Uh, so basically when there is cluster to cluster variations, the IMF, the composite IMF or the galaxy integrated IMF is not just a pileup of IMFs at the same position, but you have a broadening uh, due to the different parameters of the different clusters. And so you get a shallower slope at both ends, the low mass end and the uh, high mass end. But I'll take, I'll take for now uh, this Paravano et al as a backbone for comparison with, with other uh, young clusters. Uh, so there is plenty of evidence over the last few years uh, that uh, there are some degree, there is a some degree of variations of the IMF parameters. Uh, and so the whole you know, exercise is to try to quantify how much variation there are. And uh, in a second step, how much we can explain from these uh, variations. So I'm showing here just a few examples uh, out of many. Uh, so uh, the first one is uh, a work by Limital 2015. So this is uh, a survey of young clusters, so a homogeneous survey of young clusters called the Sijon uh, um, survey. Uh, they have about, uh, I think, 15, 20 clusters. And uh, what they have here is the slope uh, at the uh, intermediate to high mass end. And if you can see the values of the gamma they derive, uh, uh, they vary between say 0 0.8 and minus 0 0.8 and minus two. Uh, remember the Sol-Peter value in this notation is minus 1.35. So there is 
uh, already uh, indications of a lot of scatter in in, um, in Milky Way clusters. So these are all young clusters uh, around their value. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, also Milky Way star cluster. So this is a work I published in 2014 for a small sample of eight uh, young clusters. Uh, but uh, we I tried to infer the probability distribution function of each of these three parameters. Remember the slope at the high mass and low mass and characteristic mass uh, across the entire stellar mass uh, range for these eight clusters. Um, and so this is using a Bayesian inference method. And so basically uh, we put a prior, we put a likelihood and then use. So the advantage of Bayesian's, uh, Bayesian inference is that you can use the individual stellar masses uh, without binning. And you can also use the individual errors on stellar masses. Uh, and so this is very interesting. And so what we get is uh, that uh, the, if, if everything was universal uh, within the one sigma confidence interval, we should get a global overlap of these uh, uh, one sigma contours that you see uh, for the parameters. Uh, and there is no such uh, uh, global overlap uh, at the one sigma confidence interval. And the cross that is shown is the values of the galactic field. So not only the clusters vary a little bit between each other, but they don't necessarily overlap or the galactic field values. Uh, the figure on the right is uh, also a basic, from uh, WISE, is for clusters, young clusters in M31, uh, about 80 clusters. So the, 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 uh, uh, the, you know, the clusters are further away. So the completeness is uh, affecting uh, very much the stellar content at the low mass end. So they are sensitive only to the high mass end. So this is what is shown here. Every circle that is shown is basically the mode value. So the most likely value uh, um, uh, for each of these clusters and the one sigma confidence interval and the horizontal line is the 1.35 uh, Sol Peter value. And again, here you see that, uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of scatter uh, in between clusters and the, some of the clusters don't overlap uh, at least within the one sigma confidence interval. So the, the you know, the, the message from this uh, uh, study is, is that there is some degree of variations. Uh, but uh, I, I would say there is a caveat here in this. Uh, so, so it's very interesting. It's very, uh, you know, indicative of variations. Uh, but we have to put things in context of statistics. Uh, you know, in in, in these uh, uh, samples, there is eight or twenty and fifty clusters. Now, if we look how much, how many clusters the Milky Way young clusters forms uh, per cycle of ten to twelve million years. Uh, given a certain star, galactic star formation rate and given a certain cluster mass function, initial cluster mass function, and given some truncations for the upper and lower mass limits of the clusters, we get that the Milky Way uh, forms anywhere between 10,000 to 100,000 young clusters per cycle of 10, 12 million years. So actually, uh, if we find three or four or five clusters that look identical, we shouldn't rejoice too much because um, you know, it's all statistically, it's, uh, it's, it has a very weak significance. So actually, we were thinking of how can we uh, increase, um, you know, the statistical relevance of this variations uh, for, for the pa different parameters of the IMF in different mass regimes. Uh, so we came up with one uh, suggestion is to use um, for a larger ensemble of clusters that have been determined uh, in a homogeneous in a homogeneous sample, uh, use a certain um, statistics that can allow us to test the uh, the uh, IMF variability. So the method is based on um, looking at the uh, O star contents in the cluster in a large sample of clusters uh, and try to understand. Uh, what is the fraction of isolated O stars in the cluster? Now, why O stars? Because the O stars are the one that we see uh, very easily and that we can count very easily, not affected by completeness. Um, and then we, uh, so we have we use a, a, a survey called the Milky Way Stellar Cluster Survey, uh, which so this is pre Gaia data. Uh, so it has about four thousand clusters. Now, if you want to use the uh, O star content as a way to compare uh, things. Uh, observations to models, we have to limit ourselves to the young clusters, which is 12 million years, and this reduces the sample to 342 clusters. Uh, 
So these are uh, clusters that could potentially harbor an OSTAR, uh, whether they have it or not uh, um, is a different issue, but they could potentially, based on their age, have an OSTAR. Uh, and then we can determine for the sample of 342 clusters, what is the fraction of isolated OSTARs in the cluster. By isolated, I mean that there is only one OSTAR in a given cluster, and so this counts as an isolated OSTAR, and then I calculate the fraction. So basically, it's the fraction of a, it's the total of isolated OSTAR divided by the total number of OSTARs in all clusters. And then, uh, in order to make sense of this, we have to compare this observational quantity with uh, synthetic clusters that we construct by hand uh, under different as assumption of the IMF. Uh, and so I'll, I'll go through very briefly here the kind of um, schematic of what we are doing. Um, so first we say, well, if how much mass does the galaxy convert into young clusters per cycle of 12 or 10 million years? So this is just given by the age, which is 12 million years, times the galactic star formation rate over that period, which we assume to be constant. So let's say it's one solar mass times 12 million years. So the galaxy is putting 12 million solar masses of gas are being converted into star clusters per unit, uh, 12 million years. Uh, then we uh, uh, randomly, we, we select the cluster mass function, out of which we randomly sample cluster masses from this uh, distribution and we can play with the exponent of the cluster mass function, uh, the, the parameter beta here. Then now we have uh, cluster masses. So for each cluster mass, we randomly sample a, a, a stellar masses out of this uh, cluster mass reservoir. Uh, assigning to each cluster a certain set of parameters of the IMF, the slope at the high mass and low mass and, and characteristic mass. Uh, now, these synthetic clusters are uh, basically zero age. So in order to make them resemble and compare them to the uh, observational sample, we have to assign an age to each synthetic cluster. So what we do is to uh, we have the uh, age distributions of the young cluster in the sample. So these 342 clusters, we have their age distribution. We randomly sample an age from this age distribution and assign it to each synthetic cluster. Remember, the synthetic cluster can have anywhere, depending on the star formation rate that is adopted and, and other parameters between 10,000 and 100,000 clusters. So now the clusters have an age, but before we can count the fraction of isolated O stars, uh, we have to make the correction for the effects of stellar evolution. So uh, stars that have a lifetime of hydrogen plus uh, helium burning time smaller than the age of the cluster has to be removed have to be removed from the statistics uh, so we have to make this uh, stellar evolution correction now before we make the stellar evolution correction we have to make a binarity correction because you know the the lifetime of a 30 solar mass 30 plus 30 solar mass is not the same as a 60 solar mass so for each uh, stellar mass uh, stellar system mass that we have in the cluster we draw a binarity probability that is uh, uh, drawn co coming from observational constraints of massive clusters so once the system is considered a binary we also draw a random value of the mass fraction of the binary and, uh, of the secondary and primary so now we can make the whole correction for binarity and uh, stellar evolution we also make some other corrections. Uh, one correction is to make a, a correction for the completeness of the sample. Now, in the synthetic, in the observational sample, we have 342 clusters, but we are not seeing all clusters. We are missing out further away bright clusters and nearby faint clusters, so we're missing out a fraction of the clusters. Uh, so we have to throw out a certain number of our synthetic clusters from the statistics, and we do this correction of completeness based on, on of cluster completeness based on the B star content, so the intermediate stellar uh, masses. Uh, so we we try to match uh, the uh, B star content between the observations and the uh, and the models. And finally, a final correction is to make a correction for the ejected O stars. So there is a fraction of, it, of uh, O stars and the cluster that gets ejected by dynamical interaction, and we have to correct for that. So we have a calibration coming from n body simulations from the group of uh, Krupa, O, and Krupa. And so we use this as a function of cluster mass. We eject a certain fraction of the O stars. So now that we have made all these corrections, we can calculate the fraction of uh, single or isolated O stars and the clusters. Now, the crucial step in this whole process is, is here, is uh, basically um, uh, how, do you, how do we fill stellar masses 
for a given cluster mass? How do we uh, uh, sample uh, the stellar masses? So one way, of course, is to say that the IMF is universal. And that means that the, uh, the triplet of parameters, the uh, gamma, the large gamma, small gamma, and the characteristic mass are always the same, uh, irrespective of the mass of the cluster. And what basically varies is just the normalization. Uh, the other way is to allow for a certain uh, scatter in the parameters of the IMF. Uh, let's say it's a Gaussian function. So the parameter uh, of the height and uh, the exponent is a Gaussian with a certain width. Uh, and then whenever I want to assign a value for a given cluster, I will randomly sample from that distribution. And the same goes for the other two parameters. Uh, and then we can play with the width of this uh, Gaussian distribution uh, functions for the three parameters. Uh, and then we can repeat the exercise many times under different assumption of this distribution function of the parameter and try to see if we can match the observed value of isolated those stars. So basically these are what is shown here is basically distribution functions for the different parameters. So as I said, you can try Gaussian function of a different width. We also try a boxcar function. Um, uh, and so uh, the, but the, the, the mean value of the, dis the distribution we take is always the galactic field value, basically. Uh, of course, that can be changed as well. Um, so the, the, the basic result of this exercise is shown here. Now, you, you don't need to worry about the acronyms, acronyms, but so on the top panel, we have the single star or the isolated O star. Um, um, uh, and so the observational value is shown as the dashed line. And so the, the value is around 13%. So there is 13% of isolated O stars in this sample of clusters. Uh, and the lower panel is the lonely O stars. Lonely means that they are even more isolated in the sense that they, they are, it's an isolated O star, and then there is no B stars, and then there is low mass stars. So it's even more isolated uh, in that sense. So the fraction drops to maybe 6 7%. Uh, the the uh, two types of symbols, the orange and the purple, uh, magenta, are the synthetic uh, uh, models. Uh, and uh, it goes in the sense from uh, left to right and goes into uh, increasing uh, uh, variations in the IMF parameter. So on the left, you have the universal IMF, and on the right, you have a non-universal or with a certain uh, broadness of the uh, parameter distributions. And so you can see that uh, in order to fit the observations, we need to allow for a certain width of the parameters distribution uh, of the IMF. For a constant universal IMF, we overestimate the fraction of isolated O stars by a factor of two. Uh, so now the two symbols, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Orange symbols are basically when we take the entire um, synthetic clusters, and even after we throw out some uh, clusters by the uh, um, completeness corrections, we take out all the synthetic clusters and we calculate the fractions for them. Uh, of course, this is not exactly the way it should be done, uh, so we do it in another way. We take subsamples out of the total number of synthetic clusters, we take subsamples of uh, of clusters which are equal to 342, which is equal to the observation sample, and we calculate uh, the fraction of isolated st uh, stars on those sub samples. We take 10,000 realization, and then we get the magenta points. Of course, because it's, the samples are smaller, the error bars get bigger. But even then, within the one sigma confidence interval, we cannot reproduce um, the uh, observational values of uh, isolated O stars. So to give you a quant quantitative number of how much this the width of the Gaussian should be. Uh, we see we we found out that we need uh, a standard deviation of the um, of the Gaussian, for example, for the slope at the high mass end of 0 0.6, around the Solpeter value of 1.35. So that means that within one sigma we have uh, slopes that are uh, as shallow as 0 0.7 and as steep as 0 0.2. And remember this. Uh, results from here, uh, for example, the session clusters, this is typically what is observed by direct measurement. So we, we get values in between 0 0.8 and 2. Uh, so it's actually the result is, uh, is consistent with the smaller samples, so the inferences from uh, smaller samples. Uh, <clears throat> so of course, uh, when we say this here, we didn't put any, uh, we didn't assume any correlation uh, between 
the mass of a cluster and the parameters of the IMF it can have. When we do this random sampling of cellular masses and, and for a cluster mass, we didn't put any physical constraints. So, you know, a massive cluster can get a shallow slope or a steep slope around the Solpeter value. Uh, there may be a, a more refinement to include uh, here and make a connection between uh, the physical uh, or the mass of the cluster or other properties of the cluster and the, the slope that it has. Uh, so I'll come here uh, very briefly to some ideas to explain how much scatter we can have. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to cover all models of the IMF. Uh, it would be impossible. Uh, but I just want to give you one example which can show that you can get, uh, under which circumstances you can get, for example, shallower slopes uh, uh, of the IMF. So uh, these examples can be, uh, variations can be induced by what I call um, gravity-based process. Uh, so probably most of you are familiar with the idea of turbulent fragmentation of the cloud. Uh, we have a supersonic turbulence. We have a network of shocks of different sizes. They create compressions, uh, basically of different sizes, and which con which compress uh, m m uh, reservoir of mass of different masses. So you get a spectrum of uh, of, uh, of core masses, and then we get a truncation at the lower mass because there is a, a smaller probability than that uh, a low mass core can. Uh, be um, captured by gravity or over exceeds the uh, Bonner um, uh, the Bonner mass, for example, uh, Bonner mass. But um, but this is this is a, a picture based on only on turbulent fragmentation. Uh, so gravity here acts as uh, as uh, some contraction mechanism for, for for the gas within the core. But gravity is a long long range force. And uh, there is other things that it can do. One thing is uh, accretion from further away. And so this, uh, um, you know, my filaments or so that are feeding uh, the cores. And so this can continuously change uh, the uh, core mass function or the initial core mass function. Another more extreme uh, mechanism, which is gravity based, is the coalescence of cores. Uh, so, you know, two, mass, two cores can merge. Uh, of course, there is angular momentum. The two cores maybe rotate around each other before they merge. Uh, but this process can happen if, for example, the cores are born uh, uh, in a compact way. Uh, you know, the main free path between two cores when they are formed is small. Uh, and the, inter uh, the coalescence time scale is shorter than their freefall time scale or their contraction time scale. Uh, so this idea we've proposed that in uh, in 2007 as a uh, already as a as a mechanism to produce uh, shallower slopes slopes shallower than Solpeter. Um, and uh, already in, in at that time there was indications that uh, starburst clusters starburst clusters are clusters which have a surface density maybe. Um, a hundred times larger than Orion. Orion surface density is, you know, a hundred solar masses per parsec square. Uh, a cluster like Arches, the Arches cluster, has a surface density of about 10 to the 4 solar masses per parsec square. Uh, and so when turbine fragmentation occurs in those regimes, the in those regions, uh, there is a probability of cores merging, and cores merging means uh, more m massive cores and means eventually a, a shallower uh, IMF. So what is shown here is um, on the left panel is the time evolution of the core mass function. So these are the gas fragment, and on the and, and time flows from top to bottom. And on the uh, right panel you see the IMF. Uh, 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 also, time goes in the same way. Uh, so we start with a core mass function that is coming from turbine fragmentation. So this is the full line. And as time goes by, there is coalescence uh, happening. And what, hap what, what goes on is that you flatten the uh, slope at the high mass end. And at the same time, you uh, depress the peak because these are the most likely targets. So basically, you create an inflection point. You have a a shallower slope developing at the high mass end and a peak that is uh, being uh, depressed. So we, we create this kind of inflection uh, point. Of course, this process cannot go forever because the cores have finite lifetimes. So they, uh, you know, kind of collapse and move to the IMF. Uh, and also because the coalescence efficiency, the cores become smaller. And so uh, their cross section becomes smaller and so the efficiency of coalescence goes down. As time goes by, the IMF populates, but it keeps a signature of this uh, 
uh, inflection point. And the overall result is a shallower slope. We start with the core mass function, the, the full line on the on the on the left, which is Saul-Peter-like almost, and then we end up with a slope that is uh, 0 0.7 uh, in total. And so the results of that models are compared to the Arches clusters, which was the data at that time. Uh, and, and you can see that there was no comparison in the gas phase. We didn't have a, a core mass function, observational core mass function to compare to. Uh, it might be that, um, but I, you know, I, I, it has to still some demonstration has to be done, but it might be that this is what we are seeing in uh, in W43. So W43 is a high mass star from Grisian, and a recent paper by Frederic Mott and her collaborators, uh, in which they derived the CMF in uh, in W43, uh, shows that the CMF here uh, has a slope of 0 0.9, which is shallower than the Saul-Peter value of 1.35. Um, does this imply core coalescence? Uh, I think we don't know for sure yet. It's very hard to see cores coalescing because this process happens very fast. It happens on timescales of the order of um, the contraction timescale of the core, a few, ten, a few tens of thousands of years. Uh, but it can leave a signature, and the signature is maybe SIO emission uh, in terms of, um, you know, because you have shocks. So in, in Precisely in uh, W43, we see uh, a large S large scale SIO emission, which is probably indicative of a cloud cloud collision process. But we also see a small scale SIO emission, which may be indicative of uh, a coalescence uh, uh, having uh, taken place. So what we are seeing is possibly the signature or the outcome of the coalescence process. And so I think we, we need to to look at uh, many other regions, uh, maybe. Maybe eventually, if we're lucky, we can uh, uh, link that to a certain uh, evolutionary uh, stage. Um, so this is what I just uh, wanted to highlight. So this is a possible mechanism for creating variations. It's not the only one. Uh, and um, um, but uh, so the, the 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 basically the 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 idea that I I want you to to leave you with is that. Uh, the IMF may have some uh, level of variations given the current data, and that, uh, for example, in terms of the slope at the high mass end, the standard deviation could be uh, around 0 0.6, which is not uh, negligible at all. So now I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, uh, something else, which is the uh, uh, the star formation scaling relations. So basically, uh, the relations that connect the surface density of the gas and the surface density uh, of star formation, which we, we ref usually refer to to the Kennecott-Schmidt relations. Um, and so these relations can be obtained on galactic scales or even on individual star formation uh, scales. Uh, there are two possible ways of uh, having a scatter in, in this plot. Uh, at least uh, we, have the, uh, we have a scatter on the horizontal line, which can be due to a conversion uh, between the CO that we observe or other tracers and the H2. Uh, and we can have a scatter in the uh, vertical line. Uh, and this one in particular is very difficult to explain at the moment only by uh, observational uncertainties. So there are um, observations of individual galaxies, of subregions and galaxies where we, we have scatters by, say, by a factor of 40, 50 in the star formation rate at a given surface density of the gas. And this cannot be uh, explained entirely by, um, by uh, observational uncertainty. Uh, so I, I try to uh, go through a, a few of theoretical ideas uh, which uh, attempt to explain this uh, the scatter and the uh, Kennecott-Schmidt uh, laws uh, and then present to you uh, some of these arguments. So there are many ideas, but I'll focus on uh, basically turbine fragmentation, um, um, then uh, a flavor or or a, another aspect of turbine fragmentation in which you add uh, a certain degree of feedback, uh, although feedback in that uh, models, uh, in those models, is not um, uh, is not an active process in the sense that it uh, it interferes with the properties of the gas, but it's a stopping mechanism for the uh, star formation. So it's a gas expulsion mechanism in clusters, and then it truncates star formation. And then uh, another idea, which is the effect of existing stars. 
in uh, the development of uh, gravitational instabilities and uh, the star formation rate. Of course, there is a, a plethora of uh, other ideas, uh, you know, cloud cloud collisions and um, the dynamical pressure of supernovas and the, the, the role of the H1 disk and so on in, in setting up a certain pressure at different galactic positions and how this uh, um, affect the star formation rate. But I think I'll just focus on this few three first points. So uh, in the picture of turbine fragmentation, so the dense cores form within a turbine cloud. Uh, they can happen everywhere in the cloud. And for a cloud um, at a given position in the galactic disk, the characteristic or to first order, the characteristic mass is set by the genes mass or a modified genes mass in the disk given a certain uh, surface density of the gas. Uh, and so if we want to derive uh, bottom, uh, we need a prescription of the surface density of the gas, and we need to understand how much of that gas is star forming. So we need to understand what is the fraction of dense gas, let's say molecular gas. And uh, so we need the a description of the, uh, of the fraction of, isolate, uh, of uh, sorry, molecular hydrogen at a given surface density of the gas. Uh, and then we need a certain efficiency factor to understand how much of that gas is actually effectively converted into uh, stars. Uh, so uh, there has been quite a bit of work in that direction. So uh, groups like uh, Kramholz and collaborators and then uh, Padovan, Nodlon and others have worked on this. Uh, so uh, in order to get, for example, a molecular gas fraction, you run a PDR models for clouds of different uh, masses, different surface densities and different metallicities and you can uh, compute the FH2, the value of the molecular gas fraction, at a given surface density. Uh, holes, for example, have calculated the efficiency based on theoretical arguments. What is the efficiency for per, per unit time, per freefall time, in a GMC of a given mass? And he found out uh, that uh, the efficiency is uh, basically linked to the dynamical properties of the cloud, uh, namely the viral parameter and the Mach number. So with these two ingredients, if you have the FH2 and you have the efficiency per freefall time, you can calculate the, the star formation rate uh, as a function of surface density. And this is what uh, Mark got at the time in 2009. Uh, so what is shown here is the sigma H1 on the left, the sigma H2, and basically the total gas, sigma gas, as a function of uh, the star formation rate as a function of sigma gas. I'll focus on the last panel only. Uh, in this model, you have a dependence on metallicity only via the term, the molecular gas fraction, uh, because the efficiency per freefall time depends only on the dynamical properties, the viral parameter and the Mach number. And for, for a fixed value or fixed mean value of alpha virial and Mach number, uh, Mark derives these um, uh, uh, curves and for different metallicities going from lower metallicities in the bottom to higher metallicities uh, uh, on top. And then he makes the comparison to the Bigel et al. Uh, uh, sample from the Things survey. So these are sub-regions within uh, about 11 or 12 nearby galaxies. Uh, and so what you what you can see here is that the, this model pre uh, presents a good envelope in terms of uh, encompassing all the observations. Uh, we don't know yet actually if it's a good fit because the, uh, the observations are not segregated by metallicity. So, but at least it can explain some of that uh, scatter in the low surface uh, density regime. At high surface densities, uh, all the, uh, this is not uh, very much shown here, but if you if you look in his paper in detail, at high surface density, FH2 becomes uh, all close to unity. Basically, everything is molecular and uh, there is no dependence on metallicity. Uh, so it becomes independent of uh, metallicity. Uh, so this is at least a way of explaining variations or scatter by effects of metallicity in the um, uh, in the uh, molecular gas fraction. Now one other way is to look at say now I I assume a fixed metallicity let's say this the stellar metallicity, solar metallicity, and then I want to change the dynamical properties of the cloud. So instead of assuming a fixed mean value for the uh, for the Vira parameter and Mach number as a function of surface density, uh, I investigate how much variation there is in this particular quantity um, 
uh, and then try to construct the Kennecke Schmidt diagram. This is what Chris Federat has done. So I would like you to focus only on the on the middle uh, panel. Uh, the left part of the middle panel is numerical simulation Chris has done. So these are molecular cloud uh, uh, done in cubes, turbulent molecular clouds, uh, done with different uh, Mach number going from five to 50. And so he uh, measures the star formation rate, basically how much uh, sink particles uh, are formed uh, and measure the star formation rate and plots it as a function of surface density. Uh, and on the, in the middle panel on the right, it's uh, theoretical expectations uh, coming from uh, Pardon one uh, model on the model, multi free fall time um, model. I, I won't go into the whole, whole detail, but the point is here there is there is a good agreement between the simulations and the observations in the sense that uh, the at lower Mach numbers, the curve is, is lower than at higher Mach number at a given surface density uh, of, the, uh, of the gas. Uh, again, uh, what, what is shown here is that if you vary the dynamical properties of the cloud, of the clouds, you can uh, explain or generate some amount of scatter. Uh, however, the observations that are shown here, which are in gray, the gray points, which are a combination of individual star forming regions and entire galaxies, uh, are not segregated by mean values of the Mach number. Uh, and to be very honest, I, I, I don't think that uh, the, you know, I don't think that the upper curve at Mach number equal one really applies to these uh, observations, but the exercise still has to be done. We actually don't know if all the ones that have match a Mach number of 100 do actually have a Mach number of 100. Uh, so this is just to say that turbulent variation and turbulent properties can induce some scatter, but there is, I think, a little bit more work to, to be done, verifications to be done. Uh, maybe a, a, an indication that uh, turbulence alone is not enough for uh, explaining the, um, uh, the star formation rates in, in clouds and galaxies as a whole is, is this plot. Uh, what is shown here is the cloud mass versus uh, star formation efficiency per unit free fall time. So the observations by Bram Oxendorf uh, uh, in 2017 uh, show that the efficiency, there is a small decline in the efficiency per free fall time as the cloud uh, mass increases. Uh, and then if you take the same, the same GMCs and you apply the prescriptions of the turbulence only uh, uh, fragmentation model, uh, you will get the opposite result. That is an efficiency of free fall, uh, free fall time that increases with cloud mass. So there is a mismatch here between uh, observations and models. So uh, now comes feedback. Uh, this is where feedback can help. Um, so the idea in, in this model that I'll present you is that, uh, you know, most of the star formation happens, of course, in clouds, but it ha happens in clustered uh, way. Uh, you know, so these are think of them as proto cluster clumps within a bigger GMCs. Um, so again, here, if we want to have uh, the star formation rate, we need the prescription for the efficiency per, per unit time and the molecular gas fraction. For simplicity, I will adopt the same molecular gas fraction as uh, the one of Kamholz. So I have one piece of the of the puzzle, which is the same. So I'm going to base my comparison on uh, the second term, which is the efficiency per free fall time uh, in the presence of feedback. Now in the presence of feedback and stellar winds, because stellar winds are metallicity dependent, uh, the efficiency per free fall time uh, doesn't depend only on the surface density of the gas, but also on metallicity. So we have a, and then in this model, we have a dual dependence on metallicity coming from the molecular gas fraction and coming from the efficiency per unit time. So the model is very simple. In a nutshell, uh, what I do is to take a protocluster clump of a given mass and certain properties which are calibrated from observation. So it has a certain uh, Mach number, mass size relation, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, co the, the clump is subject to turbine fragmentation. So at each position within the um, Within the clump, there is a coarse forming with a different, slightly different uh, core mass function because the Mach number is different, the mean density is different, and so on. The cores have a finite lifetime, so they live for that lifetime, uh, and then they convert into stars. So I assume here a, a one core to one star conversion. Well, of course, you can put a sub-fragmentation model, which is a more complex. 
Uh, and then I account for the feedback from the massive stars, stars more massive than uh, five solar mass. And uh, when I take a core to star, I also assume a, a fixed core to star efficiency of one third. So one third of the, each core mass goes into star. Of course, this can be further explored and, uh, and refined. And uh, basically in this model, gas is expelled uh, when the effective wind energy, so a fraction of the stellar winds energy uh, uh, blows up uh, the, the cloud basically uh, exceeds the gravitational binding energy of the, of the clump. Um, so this, these are examples of uh, for five uh, clouds. Everything is similar in those five clouds, exactly similar. What is only different is the uh, value of the metallicity. So as, as a function of time, what I'm showing here is the ratio of the wind energy to gravitational energy. For, for weaker winds, let's say one-tenth of the, uh, of, of the uh, solar metallicity, the winds are weaker and, and uh, weaker by a factor almost of 10 because the scaling is almost linear between metallicity and uh, mass loss rate. Um, so if the winds are weaker, it means that they are less efficient in expelling the gas from the protocluster environment. Less efficient in expelling the gas means that star formation can go on for a little bit longer uh, in the in this uh, clump, and that means that you will we will end up with a higher star formation efficiency. So for a given for at weaker metallicities, this model implies that we will have uh, a higher star formation efficiency, final star formation uh, efficiency. Uh, well, is there is a, a certain uh, observational confirmation of this on cluster scale? I would say we don't know yet. The we cannot. This measurement hasn't been done really for a large ensemble of clusters at different intensity because most of the clusters we're looking at in the solar neighborhood are solar intensity. So we need to do this exercise, you know, using extra galactic clusters. Uh, but on galactic scales, there might be some indications of this uh, in the sense that we're seeing uh, star formation efficiency that is increasing with decreasing intensity. Um, and so here we have uh, at solar metallicity an average over spiral galaxies, and then M33, SMC, etc., have a, a higher star formation efficiency and a lower metallicity. Um, so in, in this model, the efficiency per free fall time is also uh, uh, has a metallicity dependent uh, and it has a surface density dependence. I will skip a little bit some of the details, but just to show you here the results. Uh, if you if you compare now the efficiency per free fall time as a function of cloud mass, uh, you get uh, the trend that is observed in the observation. So this is a uh, on the left you have a plot showing the efficiency per free fall time on the vertical axis, shown as a function of the uh, cloud mass, uh, and there is also a, a third direction for metallicity. But in terms of the efficiency per free fall time as a function of cloud mass, you can see that is uh, uh, decaying with uh, increasing uh, cloud mass, exactly as the uh, observation imply. So now, why is this so? Um, the reason is very simple, is because uh, the uh, stellar feedback, at least here I don't consider only stellar winds, but stellar feedback is strongly nonlinear, and it's basically supralinear with uh, with the stellar masses that are formed, if we uh, it's it's the, to the power four. So if we we increase the masses of uh, that are formed in a, a in a given cloud of massive stars by the amount of mass uh, that is in massive stars by a factor of two, we increase the feedback by a factor of six, sixteen. Now increasing the feedback uh, this much dramatically means that we are much more efficient in expelling uh, the gas. Uh, from uh, a certain a star forming region, and uh, and this truncates the the uh, the uh, uh, the star formation process, and we have more stellar mass and more massive. Statistically speaking, we have more much more massive stars forming in a high mass cluster or protocluster clump. So basically, the truncation due to the feedback happens faster in high mass. Uh, uh, cloud and the integrated efficiency per unit time decreases uh, in high mass clouds. Uh, and so, if we go back to the picture when we where we construct the Kennecott Schmidt diagram, uh, I showed you before the Kramholz et al. result in to, from 2009, uh, and then on the top panel uh, there is the turbulent plus feedback uh, uh, result uh, at the low. 
At the low surface density regime, there is some variations, but not much. So basically in the sense that the effect of the molecular gas fraction dominate, we have less star formation rate when there's, uh, there are less molecules due to lower metallicity. Uh, but in the high surface uh, density regime, it's the opposite effect. We have a higher star formation uh, rate at lower metallicity. Um, and due to um, you know the, the star formation going on for longer in low metallicity environment because the feedback mechanism feedback quenching mechanisms are less efficient. So uh, in terms of the star formation rate, do we see uh, on galactic scales? Do we see indication of this? Uh, I, I think the dices are still out. I, I don't know. We, I think it has to be confirmed. But if we look at the uh, at the, uh, this plot of the Kennicott Schmidt diagram, so this is taken from Kennicott and Evans 2012, their last review, where they show the star formation rate uh, versus sigma gas. So these are individual galaxies here. And in particular, the blue, uh, the blue points are all dwarf irregular galaxies, all of which are uh, uh, lower, uh, you know, uh, have lower metallicities than, uh, than the sun. And you can see that at lower surface densities, they are a bit lower than the main sequence, and at higher surface densities, they are uh, above the main sequence of you know normal spirals and, and starburst and so on. So could this be indication of uh, this process, metallicity-dependent feedback effect? Uh, I think it, you know, some work needs to be done. It would be interesting. And actually, one doesn't really need to probe the entire surface density regime for that. Uh, one just needs enough uh, measurements uh, at a given uh, you know, surf surface density range of the gas, uh, but for different, uh, very different metallicities. So I think uh, there is promising work. I, I know that I'm involved in a project here with uh, people in Copenhagen. There is a project called the Metal Things. So where we're taking the Things uh, survey galaxies and uh, measuring the, uh, the metallicities in, in nebular regions uh, around each two regions. And so possibly we could uh, um, give a, a, a similar plot, but for individual regions in the, uh, the Kennecott Schmidt diagram. Um, so the final, well, well, another mechanism by which we can get uh, uh, variations or scatter in the Kennicott Schmidt uh, relations is due to the uh, effect of existing stars in galactic disks. So if one looks at, uh, at the uh, uh, radial density profiles of the different components in a, in a galaxy, you can see um, uh, uh, that the, you know, the pink points here are the H2, then you have the blue is the H1. And uh, the gray is the sum of both. So basically um, the gas phase. Uh, and then if one compares to the surface density of the stars, you can see that, uh, so on the red points, uh, you can see that it exceeds the surface density of the gas by a factor of um, you know, almost two orders of magnitude. Uh, at least uh, in the in, in insizable fraction of the size of the galactic disk. And so I think this is, yeah, NGC 6 to 8. But the same applies to many, many other galaxies. So what that means is that on large scales, at least, uh, it's basically basically almost wrong to neglect the effect of the gravitational effects of the existing stars. On small scales, if we are talking about the scale of a single molecular cloud, the self-gravity of the cloud can dominate over the contribution of the uh, stellar potential. But on a large scale, say a KPC or more, uh, one has to take into account the uh, the, density, the, gra the gravity of the stars. Um, so without going too much into uh, the details, we, we, we worked out a, a model for, for this. The model is very simple. So uh, it's basically a model in, 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 in which we take into account the, uh, the existence of, of the gas and stars. So basically we have the continuity equation of the, 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 the continuity equation, the momentum equation of the gas and of the stars. We, what we do is we do a linear perturbation analysis. And, and the stars and the gas communicate only via uh, their uh, respective uh, uh, gravitational force. So they affect each other gravitationally. Uh, we think we take only one component of gas for simplicity. So there is gas and stars, not H2, H1 and, and stars. Uh, so uh, 
what happens is that uh, we can uh, perturb the couple sets of equations and then we can get this uh, dispersion relations and then we can get different modes of instability of gravitational instability in the presence of gas plus stars so we can calculate uh, you know we have a spectrum of modes uh, and when we make the, the assumption i mean it's it's an assumption but i think it's relatively valid is to say that uh, the fastest growing mode of the instability in the presence of gas plus stars is the one that is related to the star formation rate. Um, so we can calculate what is this, uh, uh, we determine what is the, um, this wavelength of the fastest growth mode, which I call lambda SF here. And basically we say that a certain amount of gas, uh, which is maybe a cylinder in a galactic disk, a cylinder of a certain scale height, of the, of the gas and a radius lambda SF will become gravitationally unstable. And then we can calculate uh, a certain a theoretical star formation rate from that uh, um, under this uh, assumption, which is basically the mass of this gas reservoir divided by the free fall time in the galactic disk. And so we can get a theoretical star formation rate, which depends on the surface density of the star, surface density of the gas, the velocity dispersion of the stars, and the velocity dispersion of the gas. And lambda SF is also itself is a function of all these uh, quantities. Now we have this theoretical star formation rate, uh, and then we can compare it to the actual observed uh, star formation rate. So we can make a direct comparison for any given region in the galaxy between these star formation rate theoretical versus observed. So this is what we do here. Um, for NGC 628, so what you see is the surface density of the uh, surface density of star formation plotted as a function of the surface density of the gas and the stars. Um, uh, on top, uh, it's a point by point, and, and below the model is a one sigma of the uh, of the model re realization. Um, so, I, you know, I, I would say that to first order we get. Uh, the right trend, and also uh, a, a decent, or, or a, 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 you know, a good amount of scatter of the order of what is observed uh, in the uh, in the observations. Of course, you know, if you take, you know, maybe two points match exactly for different regions, but we, uh, you know, this is a, the model is very simple. It's a it's a first order linear perturbation analysis. So the the, the uh, there are a lot of long linear evolutions that happens after that, uh, but uh, it gives a, a, an indication that uh, that uh, you know maybe the, the existing stars are playing a certain role. I have skipped some of the details here. For example, the efficiency per free fall time that we, we we have to include an efficiency per free fall time here, uh, we uh, adopt a value that is um, uh, that is coming from uh, from the observations from, from the models of, of including feedback. Sorry. So I think I have a problem. I don't know if you hear me. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, ah, okay. ah, just something appeared on the thing, so I was wondering if the slide is still. Uh, um, so, uh, so there is uh, there is also a lot of work to be done in this uh, in this um, context um, in order to understand the galactic star formation rate on large scales. <clears throat> so the the you know the. The takeaway message from this uh, section is that actually pre supernova feedback is uh, is essential. It's essential for a, for a variety of reasons. I mean, I didn't talk about the age age spreads, etc. So we you know we know from the age spreads and stuff from regions that we don't need to wait until uh, supernova explosions in order to explain the the age distribution uh, for uh, clusters that are devoid from gas. So pre supernova feedback is essential. I focused here on the effect of, as an example, on the effect of stellar winds, but all forms of feedback are important, photoionization and, uh, uh, and in some cases also radiation, radiation pressure. Uh, in the feedback regulated model, feedback plus turbulence regulated model, uh, the metallicity uh, comes into play because the feedback from stellar winds is metallicity dependent. Uh, and there might be a role for also existing stars in explaining these uh, scaling relations of star formation. 
So I don't know how I'm faring with time, whether I should jump into the last uh, uh, section or Davide? Uh, I'm, I don't know, how, how long time do you think? Uh, I think I have only four slides, but you know, uh, well, I, I'm not yeah. keeping an eye on time because I cannot see the, the time on my screen. So it's, you tell uh, me. Already one hour last. Okay. So I think I can stop here then. If, uh, if yes, yes, unless okay. there are specific requests uh, from somebody to hear this talk, about this topic. Okay, let's uh, stop here. And uh, any questions? Somebody is saying, uh, I don't hear Sami anymore. Uh -huh. uh, do you do you hear correctly? Uh, Anybody? I, I, say I hear <laughs> but I, I <laughs> okay, people are here. Okay. So, any questions? Okay, Viviana. Viviana wrote a question, but you can also join the audio, Viviana. Okay. 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 Hi. Hello. The question is about the application of the model of big feedback to, to the Galaxy NG6, NGC 628. Yes. Do you apply your model with feedback to other nearby galaxies? Uh, you, you mean uh, for the model of this uh, gas plus star gravitational? Yes, yes, yes. That's what you mean. Yeah. So uh, in principle, to be we could. Uh, the uh, the issue is just simply to get uh, access of all the data because for this uh, application you need the uh, information about the gas content. So basically, you need sigma h one, sigma h two, which we have from things and Heracles and. Um, mm -hmm. And, yes. Uh, so this is what we use, but you know, so you also need the stellar information, uh, and so you need the velocity dispersion and the surface density of the stars. So uh, Guillermo Blanc has a project. Uh, I mean, he has a, published a paper in I think 2016, maybe or 15, uh, where he has uh, basically it's more or less the things uh, galaxies for which he obtained spectra, and he's measuring the, these quantities. Uh, but he has published effectively detailed information only about NGC 62. Oh, okay. We ask him this information, we got this NGC 62, and so in the near future, or you know, when whenever data becomes more available, I, I think he didn't want to share all the data with us before he publishes it himself or the, the collaboration publishes it uh, themselves. But it would be possible to to do the same for uh, for other galaxies. Yes. Okay. Thanks. And I have another question. I can. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, you show you Dib uh, two thousand eleven. Uh, a Kenica's law with uh, integrated data from different uh, galaxies. Uh, you mean versus uh, star formation rate? Uh, see, I think you, you the mean, right fit. You mean this one? Yes, yes on the right side. Yeah. Do you remember the slope of the fit? Uh, no, I should have wrote it, but it's not exactly 1.4, I think, on this thing, but it's, oh, it's, very, okay. it's, it's very close. It's, very, it's, oh, not okay. a, it's maybe 1.5 or so. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Please, if you have any, please uh, turn on your microphone and ask your voice. No, I have a question for you. Uh, um it refers to one of the first slides you you show you showed mm -hmm. uh in particular uh, your assumption of a cluster mass function as a power law uh, what yes. are evidences about that why do you make that that assumption yes yes uh you, you mean here yes exactly yes uh well uh <laughs> There are two arguments for that. One is uh, observational, because uh, people are looking at deriving, actually, from nearby galaxies. Um, there is a lot of work by uh, Søren Larsen, for example, in the Netherlands on, the, on, on this. Uh, um, so people find values of, uh, people find first a power law with a value 
typically close to minus two. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there is a little bit of argument about whether it's an exact uh, power law uh, or if it's uh, truncated at the higher mass. Uh, and some people suggested that it's maybe a, a Schecter function. The Schecter function drops uh, faster at the high, high, high mass uh, regime. One can argue also that actually, if you take an entire galaxy and you determine the uh, uh, the spectrum of uh, the the initial cluster mass function, so for this I'm speaking about young clusters at different galactic uh, radii, you will get less massive, less in numbers, and less massive at uh, uh, in the outer galaxy. So when you sum up everything, you get a the function as a function of the summation, but not as a function of the underlying variations. Uh, so this is the observational evidence. There is evidence that is power law with an exponent close to minus two. Some people derive, you know, minus 1.9 plus or minus something. Uh, and there is also, uh, the, you know, other arguments coming from the gas phase. Uh, and so if you um, uh, look at the, um, the clump mass spectrum, the, the spectrum of, let's say, proto-cluster clumps that are for the most of them are going to form clusters, uh, you find a shallower slope of minus 1.7 and minus 1.8, something like that. Uh, I discussed this a little bit in the paper in 2011, is that actually, uh, well, this these are uh, the minus 1.7, minus, minus 1.8 is for mostly unbound clouds. Uh, we discussed that if you if you put feedback in, in the we actually we try to reverse engineer the argument. We say if we start with a minus two, you know, for a cluster mass, given a certain uh, uh, star formation efficiency, global star formation efficiencies, which is the one that I, I described in the talk, uh, what is the uh, clump mass function that we need? We show that you actually need the clump mass function for proto cluster clumps, the ones that are really going to form forming cluster and that are gravitational bound, which is also two minus two. So there is a, a, a relation between the, the beta here, the exponent of the clump mass spectrum of bound clouds and some contribution coming from the feedback. And so actually it turns up that the beta is closer to the other parameters. Um, so so if what, what I mean is that if you have a clump mass, uh, a, a, a clump mass function, which is uh, the power law for, uh, for computationally bound clouds, you you have a certain star formation efficiency that is dependent on the cloud mass. Then you end up also with a power law, but you know for the for the clusters. Okay. 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 Uh, another question. Another question. No. Okay. So I think we can thank again Sami for this very interesting talk and. Uh, People are also saying you thank you in the chat. And uh, okay, so uh, thank you again. And, thank you very uh, much. It was a pleasure. And goodbye, everybody. Have a nice day.